Uh, this month is the month of February, and uh, we are going to be focusing on, we're going to be talking about relationships. And uh, for the next couple of weeks, uh, we believe that God's wanting us, wanting to help us be better in our relationships and helping us to relate to other people. Uh, Pastor Jennifer, when she shared last week, was talked about our purpose and uh, what, if, you, if you're like, I don't know why I'm here, it's very simple. You're here to go into all the world and to preach the gospel, to, to take the good news into, into, into your area, into your, your city, into your town. And, uh, but that takes being good at relationships. That takes being good at being relatable. Because sometimes we can be so, um, have you ever heard the term so, so heavenly, mind, heavenly minded that you're no earthly good? Has anybody ever heard that before? That sometimes we can be so heavenly minded that we don't, we're, we're totally, um, it's hard for people to, to relate back to us because we're having a hard time relating to them and where they're at. Jesus was so good at relating to people. You see in his ministry that, that, that everywhere that he went, people were so hungry for what he had to say. And it wasn't because they were trying to, um, you know, grasp this great revelation, this great understanding, but he was so approachable and so available and such a representation of who God is that people, it was unmistakable. It was unmistakable with him. People knew, even the ones that didn't like him, they knew that he was from God. And they knew that if they went to him, that he was going to give them something that would help them, that would, that would give them life, and that would help them in this life. And so our job is to learn from that. Our job is to learn, well, how, how did Jesus do this? How did the saints of old, how did they have relationship with God? How did they have relationships with others? And if we, as we learn about this, as we, as we study this, and as we make this a part of our lives, we become better at it, and uh, actually uh, we're more effective in, the, in, the, in our time of living while we're here on this earth. Amen? Amen. Let's go to, um, I want to go, I want to start off this morning in 1 Corinthians. This is a scripture that was just, just dropped to me during praise and worship. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20 says, Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? This is the New Living Translation. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? Now, Paul is talking to the church at Corinth. He's talking to, to born-again believers. He's talking to people that know God, that, that have, had a, have had an experience with God, and he's reminding them. He's, 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 uh, maybe some of them have never heard this before. Maybe you've never heard this before. But when you, have been, when you give your life to Jesus, when you say, Jesus, you are my Lord. When you say, Jesus, you are my Savior, the Bible here tells us that we are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. That means that the Holy Spirit, which is part of God, lives in you. Now, we don't talk about temples. I don't invite you guys to my temple, right? Does anybody have a temple that they go to? And, you know, I'm not, to, a, a temple is just a house. That's it. It's just, it's the house of God. It's the house of the Holy Spirit. Our bodies, and so what that tells me is that God has a need to dwell in us. God has a desire to make his home on the inside of us. But the only way he can do that is by us making sure that, that we've made Jesus our Savior first when we become a born-again child of God. That, that makes room for God to be able to come in and to become, uh, to, be, to, to live on the inside of us because our body is the house of the Holy Spirit who lives in me or it lives in you and was given to you by God. You do not belong to yourself. This is a very interesting statement that Paul makes because sometimes we go, uh, we go through times in our lives, we go through stages in our lives where, where we're like, uh, we're, we're, we, uh, well, I, I'll tell you from my own experience that I grew up in a, you know, I grew up with, in a, I had a house and I lived, lived, my, lived with my family, my, lived with my parents, and I kind of just did whatever they did, right? Because you, I was at an age where I was dependent on them. And I was, uh, uh, we would, 
go to the store together, or we would go to the mountains together, or we would do things together, we would eat together, and I spent time with them. Well, then as I got older, I started to, to begin to feel this um, air of independence. You know, you get into high school, and you get, you get, to, you get to drive a car finally. You know, you get to have your license, and, and you get to drive around, and you don't have to have your parents with you anymore when you're going to the grocery store or coming to church, those kinds of things. You start, you start to feel like I'm starting to become my own person. And then God throws in something like this, and he says, you are not your own. And, and, I'm, and I'm like, well, but, but God, you created us, and you, you created us to be... Um, Examples for you. You created us to be part of the body of Christ, and you tell me that I'm not, I'm not my own anymore because I belong to you, but it's because the Spirit of God lives on the inside of you. That He is now taking, he is, he, is, he is habitating on the inside of you. I would like to say that He is even taking possession of you because He lives on the inside of you. You know, when, you're, when you own a house... You live on, you possess it, you live on the inside of it, it's yours. You know, you hear stories about people that will go and they'll, I guess it's called squatting, right? And they'll go and they'll live in a house, they don't own it, but after seven years, or whatever it is, it may be less than that, but however long it takes, all of a sudden now they have possession of it, and it's their house. When you become a child of God, when you become a born-again child of God, when you come into His kingdom... Your body is not your own anymore. And that's not a bad thing. And if you know God, if you understand who He is, that you, you have a relationship with Him, you'll understand that that's actually the best thing that ever happened to you. That is the best thing that is for you, that is the best thing for those that are around you. So He tells us here, verse 19 again, 1 Corinthians six nineteen. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. For God bought you. He didn't just overtake you. He didn't just, uh, I'm, nope, get out of the way. This is my house now. It says here that God bought you. He purchased you. He purchased you with a high price. Everybody say high. Not high as in, hi, hi, Pastor Brad. No, I'm talking high as in sky. You know, we, we think that uh, home prices have gone crazy here in the last few years. This, this is a price that's greater than, than any home price could be. God actually purchased you. And that purchase price that he gave for you was the life of his dear son. You are not your own anymore. So you must honor God with your body. You must honor God with your body. Now, as we're talking about relationships, I believe that it's important that you understand who you are in Christ. I think that is, that is a, such a foundational truth that, that, it, that we miss sometimes because we get so caught up. We allow everything else that's going on, on, on around us to determine and to dictate our actions and our activities and our thoughts and, you know, how we feel and, you know, what we like and what we don't like. We let all these things out here determine that. When actually all the time God owns us, He's taken possession of us, we're not our own anymore, that we belong to Him for a better purpose and because of a better plan that God has for us. Now, I want you, to, I want you just to, to sink in here with us this morning because this is, this, is, um, this is something that will help you be better at your relationships with other people. That if you understand who you are, you understand, well, first of all, you understand who God is, then you understand who you are, then you're going to be able to understand better the people that God is sending you to, to minister to and, to, and to, to help. You're that lifeline now that's being used by God to reach people. Amen? Go to 1 John. 1 John. First of all, let's go to, go to Genesis chapter 1. I was, thinking, I was thinking about this last night. I had a hard time sleeping last night. And, um, I normally don't. I'm, pretty, I'm a pretty good sleeper. But uh, I had to really practice what I preach because uh, the Bible tells us that our minds, when your mind is fixed on Him, 
he gives you peace. And I had, per, that's right, perfect peace. And I had to, I had to really lay there and, and force myself to, uh, to be fixed on him. And so as I was, I was thinking about him and I was thinking about God, I was thinking about in the beginning, and I was thinking about Genesis chapter 1, and I love this. This is, this is, I'm in the New American Standard. I love this. It, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, that the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. And the reason I'm sharing this with you like this this morning is because I want you to understand who God is. I don't want you to be confused in who the person of God is because God wants relationships. And you see this in Genesis chapter 1. You see that he doesn't let it go long. We don't, you know, there's a lot of um, people, we could, you know, get into a lot of different discussions on how old the earth is and when this was and what happened before this and why was the earth, uh, what does it say here, formless and void. Uh, let's see, the, the, yeah, the, in verse 2, the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of waters. For some reason, at this point in time, the earth was totally covered in water. And the Bible tells us that the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the deep. That means that the Spirit of God, there was, there was, no, nothing, there was nothing there. It says it was formless and void. And so God was looking for something. He was, he was desiring something. He was desiring something more than formless and void. This is good news this morning. This is good news this morning. He wants more than formless and void. Verse 3 says, let there be light. And there was light. So all of a sudden, God could see what was out before him. It says that God saw that the light was good. And he separated the light from the darkness. And he called the light day and the darkness night. And there was evening and there was morning one day. Then he said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the water. And let it separate the waters from the heavens. And it says that God made the expanse and separated the waters, which were below the expanse from the waters. So he created the sky and he created the, the, the ocean, the waters. And he called, uh, he called the expanse heaven. And then there was evening and then there was morning on the second day. Then he said, let the waters below the heaven be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And so God called the dry land earth and the gathering of the waters. He called seas, and God saw that it was good. So God is creating something here. He's putting something into motion so that he could have more than formless and void. So that he could have more than just uh, emptiness and, and the expand, you know, that there's nothing there except for water. He wanted more than that, and he wants more than that for us. He wants more than that for us. He wants us to have more than that. Verse 11 says, he, or I'm sorry, verse 10 says, he called the dry land earth, and the gathering of the waters he called seas, he, and he saw that it was good. Then, the, then God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, fruits on the trees bearing fruit after their kind, and with seed in them, and it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind, and God saw that it was good, and there was evening and morning on the third day. Then it goes on, he talks about uh, creating the sky, I mean, uh, the seasons with the stars. He talks about the sun, it talks about the moon. Then he gets down into verse number 19, or 20, and he says, Let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures. Let the birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. And God created great, monster, great sea monsters and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarmed after their kind and every winged bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good. And he said to be fruitful and multiply. We're learning a lot about God here. He says to be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. This was the fifth day. Then on the sixth day, it says that God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle, creeping things, and beasts of the earth after their kind, and it was so. Then he said in verse 26, everybody say then. Then, after he made the animals, the, the creepy crawly things walking on the earth, 
He said, then let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27 says, God created man. Everybody say, and woman. All right. God created man and woman in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so as I was thinking about this, I'm thinking about, well, God got us, he got the earth to a point to where it could support you and me. He didn't just... I'm hovering over the face of the deep and on the first day create man and, and male and female it took it took some some uh, some things had to be put in place put in motion so that male and female could be supported because that's how God works God does things to help us to support us because he doesn't want formless and void and he wants us to be fruitful and to multiply now, this is God in Genesis chapter 1. Go with me to God. Go, to, go with me. Go with me as we look at God in John 3. John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Now, y'all know that you know, we're reading the, uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament right now, and we're in the middle of, um, actually, we're not in the middle of it. I guess we are in the middle of it. The, the children of Israel have been brought out of Egypt, and um, we're starting to see God do some things. And... The whole, the whole time that I'm reading the, the account of Moses and Aaron dealing with Pharaoh, I'm constantly, I'm constantly thinking about why did Pharaoh not soften his heart? Because the, the Bible says that, that Pharaoh's heart was hardened, that Pharaoh had a hard heart, that he had a, he had a, um, he had a difficult time. What that means is he had a difficult time submitting to God. He had a difficult time saying, okay, God, you're actually greater than me he couldn't he couldn't have stood in the room this morning and go with it's your breath in my lungs that i pour out my praise because pharaoh would expect the praise to come to him he would expect us to be praising him and so every time you read that that his heart his his heart was hardened is because he had a a a wrong view of himself and god and that anytime god did something it made him mad even when it was destroying his people, even when it was killing the fish, even when it was mucking up their water and turning it to blood, even when it was you know, taking away the first form, it made Pharaoh mad because he wasn't willing to be submitted to God. And that same thing happens in our life. That even when, even when we don't understand what God's doing, we don't understand that God is love, and that's what we're going to talk about here in a minute, is that God is love God will do things around us and in our life, and because our heart is hardened, and because we're not softened to what God is saying, or we're not softened to what God is doing, we'll actually get offended, and we'll get upset. Was that God? Did y'all hear that? I guess we did. Maybe the, uh, when we get our new sound system, I'll have more control over it down here. Praise the Lord. But this will help you understand why sometimes people are offended at the the speaking of the gospel. They're offended at the living of the gospel because they don't they don't they don't want to submit themselves to what the gospel is truly is truly about and what God is tr- truly doing. John 3, John chapter 3, we see, we see God here. And this is a scripture that we all know, and we've, we've talked about this uh, many times recently. It says that, For God so loved, everybody say love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Go with me to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. 
I hit these two. I hit these two scriptures here because uh, these are written by John, and John had this revelation of God because he had spent time with Jesus in such a way that he walked away from Jesus and he was able to say, "I'm the disciple that Jesus loved." Now that wasn't just a uh, Jesus just loved John. But John had a revelation of that. He, he, it, that had been revealed to him in some sort of manner that he could walk away and go, Jesus loves me. Jesus cares about me. Jesus wants me to be around. Jesus is inviting to me. He, he wants me to be in a place that, where, where we can be together. Jesus wants a relationship with me. And it doesn't change. God doesn't change. Here he says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, he says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. Love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And then in verse 9, he just reminds us, of what John 3.16 says. He says, By this the love of God was manifested in us. See, the love of God is, is a part of your life. I I've, I've shared with you earlier that the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. You were bought with a price by the love of God because John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. They'll have eternal life. They'll have life as God knows it. Then he says, you're not, you were bought with a, a high price so that the spirit of the living God could live on the inside of you. And if the spirit of the living God is living on the inside of you, you have the same kind of love that God gave to the earth through Jesus Christ. This helps you with your relationships. He says, in this love... I'm sorry, go to nine. By this, we, by this, the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this love, this is the love that comes from God, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins or the exchange for our sins. Beloved, verse 11, if God loved us, then we also ought to love one another. I love that in, in, in I'm on, I'll say the word love, I love that in, uh, that Jesus tells the disciples, you know, they're asking him, which one of the commandments do we need to obey? And which one, you know, which one's greater? And how do they need to weigh in our life? And he's like, listen, there's two commandments. One is that you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and that you love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus wouldn't have told us that, first of all, if it wasn't necessary, and second, if it wasn't possible. Because since you have the Spirit of God on the inside of you, you have the love of God on the inside of you. Now, the love of God is not a, is not a love that we're nor, we normally, um, that we're used to talking about, that we're used to thinking about. The love of God here is called agape. And uh, agape is the God kind of love, is how in the Christian circles we'll, we'll call it, the God kind of love. But it is a, it is a love that is, um, doesn't require anything of the receiver. So in a relationship, when, you, when you're in a relationship with somebody, you are giving something to them, and you're also taking something from them. That it is a, it's, a, it's like a, a 50, hopefully, it's a 50-50 type relationship. That you're actually sharing, you're actually sharing this uh, bond with somebody else. So you have a relationship with God because of Jesus. Now all of a sudden, His love becomes your love. Because He's giving us His love. And the way that we give back to Him, listen, and this is important, because... In a relationship, it's not all. It's not all take. It's not all. It's not all. Well, what can you do for me, God? I need. I need this. I need this. I need my groceries. I need my bills. I need my. I need my house. I need my car. I need my. You know, my kids are a mess and all this other stuff. And I'm. And I'm just having a hard time. And you know, God, 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 this, 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 me, me, me. And you're. There's no relationship there. 
And I would say 99% of the time, you've got no love. Because you're not giving anything back to him for him to work, work with or to work through. So in a relationship, it's important that you realize that it is a, it is a, a, a one-to-one. It is, a, it is the state. This is the definition of relationship or to relate to somebody else. It's the state of being mutually or reciprocally interested. Mutually or reciprocally interested. That means uh, Pastor Jennifer and I are married. In, in, in June, we will have celebrated 28 years of marriage. Is that right? No, 29. We already hit 28. So in June, we'll hit 29 years of marriage. Well, we have had to be, uh, to reciprocate time. We've had to reciprocate feelings. We've had to reciprocate conversations. We've had to be in a place where we could, we were mutually sharing the task of raising our children, of taking care of our house, of doing... That comes from God. That's not a man-made, you know, uh, Adam and Eve, who were the first, they were the first uh, relationship that we see, human relationship on the earth. They didn't come up with this, this is what a marriage should look like. No, they actually got that from God. They understood, they understood what a, what, what a spouse was and what a, what a, uh, you know, what a husband and what a wife were, and that came from God. And so it's being mutually or reciprocally interested. So we have to go, well, how, how do we take what God has done for us and apply it so that others can see God in me or, or, or see God living through me? Because that's, that's the only way. We are, when the, when the, when the Bible tells us, to go into all the world and to preach the gospel, it's, it's saying that you're the reason that the gospel gets preached. You're the reason that the gospel gets lived. You're the reason that people hear about church. You're the reason that he, people hear about Jesus. You're the reason that people know that God is good. You're also the reason that people know that God is bad. But that's a, that is a, 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 a bad representation. That is not the truth, by the way. Just because you're the reason somebody knows something's bad. Miss Mary might be so mad at me, and she might be like, well, he's a Carolina fan, and I'm a Clemson fan, and I'm just, everything about him is bad. Well, that's not true. Right, Kayla? Because she's a Carolina person, and she's looking at me and going, no, he likes Carolina. It's not all about Clemson and Carolina, but it's, but just because somebody has had a bad experience doesn't mean that God is the author of that experience it also doesn't mean that god isn't the end of the experience without you getting involved in it you've got to get him involved in the experience so that it can go in the direction that he created it for all of your relationships are like that everything about your life is like that i wasn't trying to draw attention to you miss mary i'm sorry but we want to we have to we've got to be aware of the fact that we're carrying something on the inside of us that only that that nobody else you nobody can get there are so many people out there that are looking for the answer that you have there are so many there are so many religions out there and i say religions cuz there's so many of them where people have tried to define who God is. They've tried to define how you get to God. They've tried to define, uh, you know, the, the existential experience. And, you know, they get all spiritual and all this other stuff. There is only one way to the Heavenly Father. And that is through the love that He gave to us so that we could give it to other people. And if we're not giving that love to other people then we're not doing what God's called us to do. And you have to question, has God really worked? Has he really done something on the inside of me? So you can't let, um, you can't let your experiences, these are some things that, that I would like for you to write down, and we'll talk more about this next week, that you can't let your experiences determine how you see God. And then on the other, and then, and then right in that same breath, you've got to make sure that people's experiences with you are a true representation of God. That's why it's important that you know who God is. That's why it's important that you know what love is. 
uh, during our 21 days of prayer and fasting, our goal was to get closer to God. That was our goal. That was the, that was the desire for that. That's what, that's what was set up for that, that you would fast something that you could put more prayer or more Bible reading in place so that you could get, get closer to God and, and, and stop spending time in the world and start spending time with Him because that's where your connection, that's where your power comes from. Because again, you are not your own that you were bought with a price, a high price, and that the Spirit of the living God lives on the inside of you. I love, I think I I shared this with somebody last week. I had come across a quote. A gentleman had said, you know, we want to, we want to, um, let me make sure I get it right here. We want to, we want to push the will of God aside, this is going to be in my words, this isn't how it was said. We want to, God has a plan for us and he's got a purpose for us. He's got a will for us. And we want to push that aside and not walk in that, but yet expect to receive the grace of God while we're doing our own thing. And you, if, you're, if you are living like that, you're in, you're in bad shape. And you're, you're, heading, you're heading a direction that you weren't created to go. I shared uh, Wednesday night, and I've shared with you before, that we weren't created. When the Bible tells us that we were made in the image of God, that word image means that like, we are a, a, a copy of God. We're a copy of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're a, a three, there's three parts to us. That we're that we're a, we have a body, we have a soul, we have a mind, a will, and emotions, and then we have a spirit that's on the inside. This is exactly how God is, because we know that God, we know there's God the Father, we know there's God the Son that was in the flesh and He walked on the earth, and then we know that there's God the Holy Spirit, the Spirit, the life of God. So there's there's similarities beyond any other similarity that you could ever have on the earth. That we weren't in, we weren't made in the image of apes because the bible doesn't say that we were made in the image of of god and so god didn't create us see god can't be around sin and so when he created us we weren't created originally to be around sin or to to house sin or to have sin working in our lives and so we've got to that's that's part of what we have to work through <clears throat> let's see what time are we Eleven forty-three. all right Let's finish up to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. No, let's do this. I'm sorry. Go to 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13. This is, uh, this is known as the love chapter. This is Paul again. He's writing to the church at Corinth, and he's trying to help them understand how they're supposed to be living, the things that that they're supposed to be showing that that this is the fruit that should be being bared in their life or being bore in their life. I'm sorry, being bore in their life. He says in verse 1, If I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, and so again, this word love is agape, and it's the God kind of love, and it is a... It is not a feeling. It is not an emotion. It is not a, um, it's not a response. Do you understand what I mean by that? Sometimes, sometimes we love something because of the way it makes us feel. Sometimes we, we, we say we love somebody because they told us that, that, we lo- that they loved us first, and so we reply. That is not what this kind of love is. This is the God kind of love, all right? This is the God kind of love that requires nothing of us. And what I mean by that is that he is not waiting on us to do something to give us the love. The love is available for us. It was, it is, it is, we were, we were created for God's love. If you take John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, we were created for his love. We were created to, to house it and to enjoy it 
to enjoy the benefits of it. He says in verse 2, If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, if I surrender my body to be burned but I do not have love, it profits me nothing. Then he goes into and he, he gives us these definitions. He gives us what love is, what the fruit, how love should be looking in your life. And I want to make sure because sometimes we can think that, well, I've got to make sure that I am constantly giving this person love. But if you are not receiving anything back from that person, it's important that you don't continue to give this person love because it's just going to wipe you out. All right? Now, I say that because sometimes we get caught in, in circumstances, we get caught in situations where it is all about what you can do for the person. If you're in a proper relationship with somebody, that person should be doing, should be reciprocal. It's reciprocal. It gives back to you. It is not a, it is not a sink that is just draining like crazy. Sometimes it's a commode, it's a toilet that's just taking everything you got and just flushing it away. And they, they come back the next day and they take everything they get, you got and they just flush it away and they're just constantly pulling and pulling and pulling from you. That's not what love is. That's not what God's love is. Now, what's cool about God is that he, he is very aware of our human inconsistencies and our, our inability to be able to um, uh, understand this or, or, you know, walk in the full. He's very aware of that. And so he's very patient with us and has a lot of grace for us. But if you're one of those people that only looks to God and never is looking to give back to him, it's going gonna, it's gonna to wear out. You're gonna, you'll burn out. You'll burn out, and your relationship with God will burn out, and you'll have a, a, a negative experience with Him. He says here in verse 4, he says, Love is patient. Love is kind. It's not jealous. It does not brag. It's not arrogant. It's not unbecoming. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, and endures all things. If you're in a relationship with somebody that, that you're, you are giving and giving and giving, you're giving this to them, and you're not in a, in, in a relationship with somebody else that is able to, to help you, strengthen you, if you're not in a relationship with God, it will run out very quickly. But you've got to be surrounded too with others of like faith, other believers, because we help each other through stuff. I'm not saying that you don't ever help somebody out that needs help. What I'm saying is don't just get so consumed in somebody's life that all you're willing to do, and this is even for, this is even for family. This is even for family. That you can't, that you can't just be all of us, everything, I'm just pouring everything I can because I just, I just want this relationship to work so bad. And you're not getting anything back from it. You're not any, getting any life back from it. No, no pulse of some sort. Then you, you've got to step away from it. You've got to step away and you've got to, you've got to get back into the, the house of God. You've got to get back with the family of God. But you've got to make sure that you're, Spending time with God. You can't give something that you don't have. You can't be something that, that's not sustainable on the inside of you. And only God can sustain that. Only God can give you that. So I, I just, I, I, I want to encourage you with this because it is important and it's part of, it's part of having relationships with people. Some people will abuse you. Some people will, will take from you. They'll take, the, the relationship is just a constant pull but there's a whole lot of people out there that want to give back into you. 
a whole lot of people that want to get back into you. So these things that Paul is talking about of what love is, it's important. This is, these are things that are they're already in you. We've talked about this. We just said it recently, just said it just a few minutes ago, that the love of God is inside of you because the Spirit of God is on the inside of you. And so these things are there. These aren't things that you have to learn how to do. They're not things that you have to, you know, read a book and go, okay, seven steps to be more patient. That's not necessary. You have patience. You have kindness. You're not jealous. These are things that are, they're part of your makeup. They're part of who you are. Verse number, verse number six, again, or I'm sorry, verse seven says, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Verse eight says, love never fails. Love never fails. So as we're, as, we're, as we're walking through this month and we're talking about different relationships, next week we're going to talk more about how, how, we, how, we, how we actually have relationships with people that there are healthy ways to have relationships with people. And as long as God is the center of the relationship, your relationship with that person will get stronger in the right way. As long as it's, as long as it's the foundation is, I had a friend tell me one time that he was, I can't remember, uh, one of his professors was telling him that if both, if both individuals are looking at God, at the closer they get to God, then the closer they're going to get together and their, their, their relationship will get stronger because it gets closer because they're both heading towards God. The people in your life that are the most important, the most significant, if you're married, that's your spouse, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're a kid, if you're a child, it's your parents, it's your siblings, you all need to be heading the, the same direction. And God is that standard. God is that, Jesus is that true north that we're heading towards. That we're not, we're not just, you know, wandering around. We're like, well, you know, Taylor Swift said love is this, so everybody needs to act like this now. Or, you know, Beyonce said love is this, and now we all need to act like Beyonce now. You know, I mean, that's, that's how the world is. The world is constantly, this is, this is how you love, and this is, this is what love looks like. No, God is love. So if you want to know what love is, just go find out. You go, you go to Him. You get before Him. And you say, okay, God, show me, how, show, me, show me how this works. Show me how love of God works in my life. And so next week we'll, we'll talk more about this and we'll look at how we relate to other people in this manner because it is, it is the love of God. It's the love of God that draws. That's what draws people. When Jesus was so popular, He was, he was the open expression of God's love. Everything that he did was, a, was, a, was an example and a representation of God's love, and people were hungry for it. People wanted it. They desired it. When he, was, when he came into the city, when he came into the town, people went bananas because Jesus was, Jesus was there because they knew they, they were going to get something from God. And that's the same. It should be the same way with us. People should be excited to see us. And so we'll, we'll talk about this more next week and look at how love can affect us this way. Amen. Let's all stand. God is so good. And He wants us to be so good at showing off His love. He wants us to be so good at, at, at our relationships with people. He wants us to be so good with our, our the way we deal with circumstances, the way we deal with people, uh, situations in life. He doesn't want us, I mean, he took the earth and, and was like, I don't want it formless and void. I mean, and everything about it was, was for us. And so that he could have a relationship with us, so that he could spend time with us. I love when you're reading in Genesis chapter 3 and, and he's talking, or it's, you know, it goes through the account of Adam and Eve eating of the fruit. And, and you know, and all of a sudden they knew they were naked and, and they knew that they had sinned. They knew they had done something wrong. And, and so they were like trying to cover themselves up. The Bible says that God was looking for them. And that he said, he asked them, he's like, what have y'all done? 
you know, some, sometimes people will go, will, will, could, could take that, they could interpret it and be like, what have you done? But that's not the, that's not the spirit that God was using. He's like, what have you done? I gave you all of this. I gave you, I gave you, I gave you everything that you needed to sustain your life. You have a relationship with me. What have you done? Because God knew at that point that it was it was all different. It was all changed. We think we have, you know, Adam, Adam and Eve, they had they had one, they had one tree. One tree. That's it. They had one distraction in their life. One thing to get their eyes off of God. Just one. And it took, I don't know, I mean, I wish we knew how many days it was, but it doesn't tell us. Did not take very long. But aren't you thankful that we live in a time period? See, Jesus came so that we would have grace, so that we would have opportunity to change, so that we would have opportunity to, to make it right with God and to get right with God and to, you know, to say, okay, I made a mistake here, God, I ask you, forgive me. Well, because of Jesus, we can do that. Because we have so many more distractions to get our eyes off of who God is and what God has for us and what God wants for us. Adam and Eve, they had one, they had one tree. All they had to do was just avoid the tree. Put the yellow police line tape around it. Like, stay away. But they didn't. They didn't. So as, as, we're, as we're closing this morning, I do, I want you to consider the things that are keeping you from not seeing God clearly. We know from the word, we know from scripture that God is love. We know that love comes from God. We know that every, everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. So we know that, that God is that center. He's that source of love. And that love is not a, it's not a, it's not a perverted thing. It's not a, it's not a feeling. Love is not a sexual thing. Love is not, um, I, I think I, I need to say this. God doesn't hate anything. That there, there's sometimes in our life we get, we'll get mad and we'll say that I hate something. The love of God doesn't hate. That's not, that's. That's not part of God. God hates sin. Make sure that's clear. I'm saying anything he created. He doesn't hate anything he created, but he hates sin. And so that is, that is love is defined in that way. It's pushing sin away and getting away from it, not allowing it to, to, to wreak havoc in your life. So as, as, we're, as we're closing this morning, I want you just to, just to ask God, just be, be, be open and be pure with Him. Just ask Him, God, what, what are the things? One thing. Help me to see one thing in my life that, that, that is keeping me from, from seeing what the love of God is or from understanding what the love of God or, or what is keeping me from acting like the love of God acts. Father, I ask you to show us this morning. Father God, there's, I know there's, I know I have um, different attitudes, different thoughts that will get in my, in, in my way, in my path of your perfect love because, because what it does is it robs me from my peace that I know comes from you. And so Father God, I ask you just to, to help me, help me to, to deal with that, to work through that. Father God, help me to rise above it. And Lord, to continue to, to look to you as the author and the perfecter and the finisher of my faith. Father, I ask you to help all of us this morning. If there's anybody here that would like prayer this morning, we've got people.